taken my title from a quote from Niels Bohr, a scientist who worked on really tricky problems about the, the nature of an atom, applying mathematics and applying that kind of logical thinking to illogical problems. And the reason why he said this, because the people who were working around him trying to solve this problem were getting nowhere because they were just thinking logically. And that shift that Bohr was trying to get going, I think is the shift that we are trying to get going now in education across our systems around the world. Let me show you an example. Let me show you a list of events. And what I'd like you to do, either just on your own or with the person next to you, is put these events in order. I'm just going to shut up for a minute while you do this. In chronological order. Put these events in chronological order. You might have some connection to something. You might be able to say, oh, yes, I know when that was, and put a date on it. There's extra points for getting the dates, for getting the, the years that they are. You might have a good idea. Some of them you're going to might have no idea, and you've got a feeling for where they might, where they might sit. Okay, I'm going to stop you. But what I want you to do is to think about your thinking. Think about what was going on in your head while you were doing that and having that discussion. I'll show you the answers. Here's the answers. So the first one was the world's first ATM. That happened back in the 60s. And then Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. And then as we go through, you can see um, different events. Until the, in fact, the very last one was the eradication of smallpox. The most recent one was the eradication of smallpox. But what I want to do is, I want to keep the same content, but I want to change the question. And I want to think about it from a historian's point of view, from a history educator's point of view. What would it be that I really want to develop in young people as a historian? And actually, we know what those kinds of things are. There are things like being able to look at a story, look at a historical story through the view of, well, what's the evidence? What's the cause and effect that's going on here? So now what I want you to do is exactly the same content, but a different question. Put them in order of significance. Put these events in order of significance. Off you go. And it's tricky, right? You know, what do you mean? You know, and straight away we've got questions. Straight away we've got questions about, well, what do you mean significant? Significant to who? So you've asked me a question that's about perspectives. I've asked you a harder question, but what, I've got you to, what I'm getting you to do is think like a historian. And in fact, the answer to that question is, it depends. And of course, the answer to all of our questions, almost all of the useful questions that we ask is, it depends. And we've got to think about what it depends on. We've got to do what a board did and said, well, what if it was like this? What if we kind of narrowed it down a bit and thought about it in this way? What would be the cause and effect? What would, be this, what would come out of that? And that's what he used his maths to do. And of course now, by doing this shift, there's all kinds of changes that have happened. And these changes, I think, are kind of and, uh, picked out and exemplified by this book from the 1920s written by Bertrand Russell about education. And he talks about it being dangerous to confound the truth with a matter of fact. Because our life is not governed by facts, but by hopes. And the kind of truthfulness that sees nothing but facts is a prison for the human spirit. And I think about you know, that kind of stereotypical industrial model of education. And that was a prison for the human spirit for lots of young people, you know, when it was about those remembering the facts, remembering the dates, putting these things in order. Not really meaningful. But when we shift and we ask these different questions and we think about it in a different way, now I'm getting away from that not thinking that Bohr was talking about. I'm getting away from that just having a matter of fact, but being able to, for, for our students, for you to find your own truth in these stories and in these questions and in these events. And it creates changes in our classrooms, changes in our ways of thinking, because within that now, we've got more equity. You know, it used to be that when we asked questions, and we asked more difficult questions, and it was harder thinking, that there was less equity in that. But let me show you what I mean. Here we are in South Australia. And if I was to ask South Australians, what's the capital of South Australia? Almost all South Australians will be able to tell me that it's Adelaide. But if I ask you, what's the capital of West Bengal? There will be some people who know the answer to that. 
but far fewer than know the answer to what's the capital of Adelaide. It's the same question, but I'm just using it as a filter. It's the same characteristics of the question, but it's just, and I know that fewer people here will know the answer to that. So I'm just filtering you out. So there's an inbuilt inequity in ha asking harder questions. The more hard the question, the bigger the filter, the fewer people can answer it. So there's an inbuilt inequity. Now when I change the question from, you know, put these dates, these events in order of their date, to put these events in order of significance, everyone's got a way into it. Even if, even if you weren't born during the 60s and 70s when all those events were, you've got a way into it. Because you're thinking about the cause and effect, you're thinking about the, well, if that happened, and that had this impact and this impact, and that's changed my life. In this way, my life would be different if it weren't for that. Everyone's got a way into it. And so now, by changing the question, what I'm able to do is increase the challenge and increase the equity, not increase the challenge and shut people out. And of course, what that means is that, of course, the se that second question is much more engaging. That second question about the significance, that second question about your truth is much more engaging. And challenging. It's not challenging in that filtering way, but it's challenging in that way of um, extending the thinking, making you interpret it, making you be active in that thinking, rather than just recalling those dates and that order. And of course, the final thing for our students is it provides that opportunity for growth. Now when we've seen these ways into thinking about these, these events in this way, our ways out of it, our ways to think about it, you've got the ownership of, our students have got the ownership of. We can pick that up and run with it ourselves. And the knowledge and know-how comes through. We, now we want to learn it in order to follow these stories of our own. And I've been really disappointed by lots of the resources that are out there that have tried to support what they've called problem-solving approaches and really haven't. I'm not going to show you any particular examples. I don't want to pick on any publishers. But I'm thinking about a science textbook that's got... Um, it's, it's supposed to be a problem-solving approach. And it's a year seven, so we're thinking about 12-year-old students problem-solving about the human body. And the problem is to draw a diagram of the human body showing the digestive, respiratory, and reproductive systems. And I'm looking at the page thinking, where's the problem? It's an activity. It's not a problem. And so when we take this and actually put it in the hands of those 12-year-olds and say, well, if we were to take this idea and turn it into a problem, if we were to create a scenario, if you were to ask a what-if question, what might that be? And when we do this with 12-year-olds, in my head is a 12-year-old saying back to me, um, what if you didn't have a bum hole? <laughs> and the kids are going crazy. Oh, 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 oh. It's disgusting. Great question. What if you didn't have a bum hole? What difference would that make? What would happen? What would the knock-on effect be? So we'd have to go and we're learning about the digestive system. And in that class, another kid says, that's like a starfish. And the kids look and well, a starfish eats its food through its mouth, and then the waste, the poo, comes out through its mouth again. Ah, that's horrible. So now we've made a link between where the kids are, the kids, what they already know, what they're already thinking. We've linked the human digestive system to a starfish's digestive system. We've looked at the difference between them. We've looked at what's similar. We've looked at what's different. We're unpacking the digestive system, but through that engagement, through that equity, through that challenge, through those opportunities for growth, rather than drawing the diagram of the digestive system. And so if you think about problem solving and the shift, you know, if you think about that maths that Bohr was doing, he wasn't solving a mathematical problem. You know, with the, um, when we talk about problem solving in maths, sometimes we think about those, those worded problems that we had to do. And those worded problems, I think, are interesting because what they do is we're given the bits of the, of the puzzle. Some bits of information, our knowledge and know-how, our understanding of mathematics. Okay, so here's the problem. We've got these bits and pieces. We've got to put them together, use a particular mathematical process, and then when that comes together, then we've got the answer, then we've got the solution. And so we're very much kind of narrowing down. We're using our critical thinking. We're using our knowledge and know-how to go from these bits that are spread out to narrowing down. And that's not problem solving. That's thinking logically. Um, that's not doing the thinking, it's just being logical, really. And when we think about real problem solving, what we do is we start off with the point where we are, and we go out. We ask that what-if question. 
we ask that question about you know, the significance. Well, it depends. What does it depend on? All these different things. We start with our point where we've got a problem to solve. We've got a need. We've got a thing that we don't know. And then we go out. We do that divergent thinking to go out and think about this problem in different ways. And then what we do is do the convergent thinking. Then what we do is say, well, we've got all these things going on. What are we going to do? We're going to narrow it down. We're going to think about it this way. It depends. We're going to reduce the number of variables. We're going to make some assumptions to make the problem smaller and smaller. And then we're going to narrow down and use our critical thinking to get to that solution. And of course, even within that process, it can be quite difficult. Because this bit in the middle, the bit in the middle where we are actually switching over can be quite difficult because we get caught up in the being divergent. It could be like this, it could be like this, it could be like this. It gets kind of overwhelming. So we've got to kind of do this metacognitive step. We've got to think about our thinking and say, well, hang on, it depends on these things and I'm going to narrow it down in this way and then switch into the convergent thinking. And so there's a number of cognitive skills involved here, this divergent thinking, the switch, the convergent thinking. And of course, that's exactly what the likes of Bohr and Russell were doing. They were constantly going through these kinds of processes of divergent and convergent. And of course, it's not just one process. We have to go through that again and again and again, and we're getting somewhere. It's not quite working for us. So we go out again, and then we come in again, and then we find a solution. Well, that's not really what we were thinking. Is there another way? Is, there a, is that how it really is? Is there an alternative? Out again, and then follow that down and in again. So this, this cycle of divergent thinking and convergent thinking, I think, is what is getting us to that real problem solving rather than just solving a problem. And of course, this now is exactly, these now has got exactly the characteristics of what we would consider to be creativity. Almost every definition of creativity that we have involves these two steps of being, in, being imaginative, generating something that's novel, finding something that's new, and checking that it's got meaning, checking that it's got some value, not just, it doesn't have to be economic value, it makes me think in a different way, it makes me interpret the world in a different way, it makes me feel something different. So it's that novelty plus value. And that's exactly what this process that I'm talking about in problem solving is as well. In creativity, for a while I think creativity has been the domain of the arts, certainly very traditionally in that um, industrial model of education, and C.P. Snow's mod, uh, uh, story of the, the two cultures of science and arts being separate. Of course, now what we're seeing is those two things coming together, that creativity is required not just by artists, but by scientists, by the Niels Bohr and others. It's required not just by artists, but by historians to be able to problem solve, to be able to see these stories in these different ways. And Rebecca Solnit, a writer, quoted Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer when she said that life, that scientists live always at the edge of mystery, at the boundary of the unknown. And of course, for me, I'm thinking about it in terms of this problem solving and this boundary between the convergent thinking, the what if, and the, diver the divergent thinking of the what if, and the convergent thinking of the, well, it depends, and then following that story down. She went on to say that scientists transform the, known in, the unknown into the known, that they haul it in like fishermen, and it's artists that get you out into that dark sea. And of course, now I think what we're seeing is that that, in, that that closer interplay between the arts and the science, that bringing that interpretation, bringing that what if, getting out into that dark sea, is also the job of the scientists as well. And so I look forward to the day when in our classrooms, in South Australia, Australia, and around the world, that I hear students saying to each other in their science lessons, in their maths lessons, in their history lessons, you're not thinking, you're just being logical. Thanks for your thinking. <laughs>